when we talk about housing crisis, we tend to say that's the housing crisis and that's the solution to the housing crisis. But actually, both of these are the s different uh, articulations of the same housing crisis. It's just that one is being articulated, experienced as debt, which is what we're experiencing in the UK. E economically dead neighbourhoods, massively indebted residents in those neighbourhoods, and very poor quality development. And on the right, something completely different. But the twist to this plot is that actually these were designed and procured as property, as things to sell, whereas these places, although to some extent that was true, a lot of it is actually designed and procured as places to live and work. The problem is this, which is that fundamentally our industrial economy, the tools that we had available, said to us that we could have infrastructure over here, but there's no way of doing infrastructure over here. We can have planning tools and, and legal institutions over here, but we can't have them over there. So behind this is this fundamental assumption about our industrial economy and the way that we produce things and the way we design things. And it basically works stepping outside of architecture in a pretty similar uh, fundamental way, which is where a designer is a priest, probably in London or New York, wearing a roll neck jumper behind a drawing board or, a, or an Apple Mac. And they produce a design and then they protect it. They copyright it and then they send that recipe all the way around the world um, to the way you can find the cheapest possible labor um, where they make an object and they ship it all the way back again. Um, this is why we love this fantastic John Maynard Keynes quote, we think it's him, which is, it's easier to ship recipes than cakes and biscuits, because that's not how we do things. This is what most of the design economy is basically built on. And at the end of it, um, you need a credit card. Again, more debt to buy it on. So that begins, is suddenly beginning to break. There's a series of things happening that mean that that's no longer the case. The first one is this one. Suddenly, the web is making it possible to share information, and information wants to be free. So lo and behold, someone creates a new way of sharing and not protecting that information. Open source licenses. If you try and protect it, it's probably going to get nicked anyway. The second massive shift is this one, which is automation. And of course, this is a whole other interesting set of conversations in itself, the impact that automation is going to have on middle class labor. But actually, fundamentally, we need this to happen at the same time. So we're seeing this shift from a small number of professional companies using skilled but fundamentally repetitive labor to the idea that actually everybody can have access to those tools now um, using a parametric automation tool that says, if this, then that. And then the third shift is the rise, in, uh, or, or if you like, the opening up and releasing of digital manufacturing tools like 3D printers. I mean, 3D printers are the most well-known ones. Obviously, also includes machines like CNC machines. The thing we need to understand firstly about 3D printers is they weren't just invented, by the way. The patents just expired. They were actually invented 30 years ago. The explosion we've had recently was to do with patents. So suddenly this new paradigm emerges where actually now a designer can produce a design and actually share it with another designer and they can take it somewhere around entirely around the world and they can print it out locally. So we have this future where potentially design knowledge is incredibly shareable and we can actually be much more efficient about not making the same mistake twice, but also production is much more local and distributed. This has been termed the third industrial revolution, but it's going to have a massive, profound impact on the way that um, we potentially make things and the question of, more importantly, who makes them. And so to give a very brief outline to WikiHow, um, that is exactly the kind of insight that we began to experiment with a, a few years ago. This is uh, where I show a website that we haven't built yet, so if any of you are web developers and want to help us build it, please shout. But the fundamental idea is to make a central commons platform for the sharing of design solutions. Now, at the moment, it's a particular kind of house, but of course, that could be almost anything. And use very simple available tools. At the moment, we're using SketchUp because it's one of the simplest and most available there is to share models from which you can generate or then share a complete perfect set of manufacturing information that anybody can take freely and replicate anywhere around the world. And using a machine, in this case a CNC machine and a standard sheet material like plywood, effectively print out the parts to almost anything, but in this case a house. And those parts are effectively got embedded huge amounts of knowledge and huge amounts of complexity and they're all numbered and so you can take this kit on site and build it very very quickly. So the power of these tools of complexity is effectively they allow you to massively lower the thresholds of time and cost and skill. That's not a soft exercise, it's a very hard-nosed exercise. So really thinking about this wonderful Japanese design concept, yoka poke which um, is all about making sure that you can't put a piece in the wrong way around. Actually requires a huge amount of knowledge to think through not just those things about assembly, but also safety. 
So the house that we've built recently, it looks like a kind of stubby block, but what we're trying to experiment with is a process for assembly where you don't actually need scaffolding frameworks. You can do it just with a mobile scaffold. <coughs> we are aiming to develop very high-performance, sustainable, customizable homes that for hope get rid of this distinction between housing for rich people and housing for poor people. And then inside the house, of course, we're creating this open domain for this exploding um, area of devices for plug-and-play services that can put the users back in charge. So I just want to sing the praises of Francesco and the team at Arabs who have, in our prototype house up the road, have done this incredibly interesting set of innovations around, first, the shift to, from high-voltage AC to low-voltage DC, which is lower energy and you can't electrocute yourself. Open source controls, sensors, thermostats, we're all familiar with this stuff. Of course, Nest are doing it. The difference is that with open source platforms, you own your data. It's not going off to a company in Silicon Valley. This is what we're trying to develop, our affordable, fast, and modular housing systems to effectively massively open up access to design solutions which have previously been seen as very, very expensive. And that is obviously the house that's currently there. It's WikiHouse version 4.0.